Good morning, how are you? Good morning, how are you? Hi, Chandra, good morning. I didn't know that you were able to see me. Yeah. Uh, good, good, yeah. good to see you. Good to, I, I see that you are gone to that place rather than doing it on Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, Murthy wanted me very much. I also said I should do it. Yes. Professor Rao and Mrs. Rao, good morning. Satya Murthy here. Thank you, sir. Sandra, you were young at one time. Of course I was, yeah. <laughs> I was at one time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With a lot of black hair at one time, yes. Well, that was in 88. Oh, okay. Jay Kumar there. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, Chala. Oh, Chala Jay Kumar there. Oh, is there? Mm -hmm. Namaskara. Hello. Namaskara. Namaskara. So, Professor SCN has come to the campus, sir. Sure, sure. Namaskara, madam. Very good. Namaskara. Sir, good morning. Madam, good morning. Satya Murthy here. Yeah, sure. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Professor Satya Murthy? Yeah, we are fine. Thank you, madam. I was just remembering. No, so nice. Whenever you think we can visit you, we can visit you. No, he, actually, they are, people are visiting him. Okay. Providing, providing all COVID protocols. Sure, you. I will I will check with his office and then call on him and you. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure. Krishna. <laughs> Come to the front, come to the front. There is a lot of space. Here. So, Jainthi. Jainthi yeah, also is there. Good yeah, morning, Jainthi. Uh, I don't know if she is able to hear you. Yeah. Oh, Professor oh, Jemis. Uh, good morning, Professor Jemis. Good morning. Good to see you all. Good morning, James. Good morning, Sari. Uh, good to see you. Can you tilt it? Uh, Come to the front and somehow 
ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ಅನ್ಕೊಂಡೆ ನಾನು ನಿಮಗ್ ನಾನ್ ಗೊತ್ತಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇಲ್ಲ ಹೌ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಹೌ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ರೆಕಗ್ನೈಸ್ ಯು ಟೆಲ್ ಮೀ We still have about two, three minutes. Uh... This is live, uh, this is YouTube is live, live stream on YouTube. So, do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it? morning professor rao and uh, good morning professor jm is good morning good morning professor rao uh, i don't know uh, madam good morning good morning good morning hello oh, ajay professor yeah, asian good morning good morning ajay yeah good morning ajay <laughs> sanoj yeah, good morning Good morning. 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 Hi Kalidas. Hi. Hi Kalidas, good morning. How are you? Muted. Kanthi number 3 is there. Number 3 is there. Sir, wait a few. Wait a few. Good morning sir. Good morning. Hey, can I have the speaker? Okay. No, it's okay. Okay, I know, I know. Professor Sienna Rao, Bharatarata Professor Sienna Rao and Madam 
uh, in the material, both of them came over to Andy Bar, I mean, they wanted to put up here to pay tribute to their uh, long standing friendship, of course, a colleague and a cherished organic chemist of our country. In that connection, in that context, we brought Professor Sena Rao to our campus and he spent a couple of days. It was indeed at the time that we got our the guest house, what is called as a visitor's forest retreat, uh, we had that inaugurated. So when he was with us in Isabelantapuram campus, he was generous and immediately wished to ex you know, sort of establish a memorial lecture in the memory of uh, Professor M. George. And that's how we had a generous uh, endowment fund given away by Professor C. And uh, the first endowment lecture was conducted last year. 2020, which was given by Professor D. Balsamanur. In fact, it is a proud uh, privilege and honor for me to inform all of you that we have with us Professor H. Chandrasekharan, a well known, I think, renowned organic chemist of our country, in fact, with us here in the campus to give the second Professor M. B. George Memorial Lecture. I think you ask, you talk to any chemist, there wouldn't be anybody who would not know Professor H. Chandrasekharan, but I think it is for the benefit of uh, the younger generation. And the audience that is uh, remotely connected with the chemistry that I have to sort of go through his, his uh, you know, enviable uh, meeting. Let me do the honors. Professor S. Chandrasekharan had his uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree obtained from Madras University. That was in 1967, master's. And then went on to do PhD in the same university with very, again, well known synthetic organic chemist of that time, S. Professor Swaminathan, and 1972. He got his PhD and subsequently he went to work with uh, a great synthetic organic chemist. You know, talk about material basic and endosynthetic analysis, you, you think of immediately for Sergei Kore, the Nobel laureate at Harvard University. And he spent uh, almost five years there, but with an intervening one year uh, in, a, in a syntax uh, you know, uh, research laboratory uh, industry for a year. 1997 was when, I believe, that he came back to. Uh, India to join and uh, you know take up the position at IIT Kanpur as a lecturer. Of course, by 1980 he became an assistant professor and went on to become full professor by 1984. Spent a considerable amount of time up until 1989, uh, which was when he made a move to uh, the Organic Chemistry Department of uh, Indian Institute of Science. And I was just born there for doing my PhD, 88, and I was in my first year when Professor uh, S. C. N. joined the department. Of course, being there. Um, what is it that he has not done to the organic chemistry and to the institution as a whole? I think he has, he's been a great, was it, he's been a great contributor, contribu contributor not only to the institution, to the department, in fact, at national level. So he was the chairman of the Department of Organic Chemistry from 2002 to 2010 for eight years, chairman of the Division of Chemical Sciences for two years again, 2010 2011, and became dean of chemical sciences. From 2011 to 2012. He was Hindustan Liver, Hindustan Liver is a professor, sub distinguished fellow, inside distinguished professor, professor, and whatnot. For his outstanding research in the area of organometric chemistry and synthetic organic chemistry, which spans from development of synthetic methodologies to natural product chemistry to carbohydrate chemistry to development of even organic materials, I think it's a wide span. For his contributions, he has been recognized with pretty much everything that is on the planet in our country. Starting off with, you know, Sanchez Sulubatana Prize. And uh, presently, uh, one of the well known ones, the Goyal Prize. He has been a JC Post National Fellowship Fellow. He has been an elected, elected fellow of all the three academies and a co of course, of the World Academy of Sciences. He has served in various capacities at national level and in, in international arena as well. To name a few, he was the chairman of Na chairman National Committee of IUPAC at INSA for three years and a bureau member of IU IUPAC from 2001 to 2009 for eight years. He's a member of the Executive Committee of IUPAC from 2007 to 2009. Secretary of Indian Academy of Sciences from 2004 to 2009. Treasurer of Indian Academy of Sciences. President of Chemical Research Society of India that is really popular in our country. Today, the CRSI attacks close to about 800,000 students for this conference, national conference. And of course, the main agenda of Professor Sri Nadal, we are really privileged to have this 
uh, to have this been started by Professor Rao. Professor uh, S. Chandrasekharan has been uh, the uh, chairman of Task Force on Green Chemistry DSC for several years. It was start, starting from 2006. I'm not sure if it's still active in the Green Chemistry yeah. Initiative of DSC. And uh, you know, he was a regional editor of Tetrahedron Letters, which was very popular from 2007 to 2014 for seven years. Became a member of the board of consulting editors on Tetrahedron Loop and uh, chairman of uh, National Organic Symposium Trust, which is considered to be in India a garden like American history. It's indeed an honor to have those institutions and to deliver the second Professor M.B. George Memorial Lecture on our campus. In fact, yeah, the scare with, with COVID has been on. And notwithstanding everything that has gone around the campus, we have been we have been praying about the fact that we have been running the classes here. Nothing has halted. At any given time, we have had about 50% of the students of university. And so much around, but still we maintain a bio bubble and continue our, our activities. But it's time now to sort of warm up in terms of conducting some scientific activities. It was initially planned to have this talk delivered online, but I was keen that, you know, Professor Eastern Shadron, at the stage that he is, that it would be wonderful to have him on our campus. But initially we planned to, plan to have it in the month of January, but then we decided that we go ahead in the month of December that Professor Eastern Judge uh, can be remembered. And with, I think Professor Eastern, I think we have to applaud that he consented to come to the campus with all the scale of the Omicron that's spreading in the country. So thank you so much. Of course, we are fortunate to have Professor Sienna Rao and Madam Indamati Rao grace the occasion online. So thank you very much and I welcome both of you, Madam Professor. I extend a warm welcome to those witnessing the talk online. With that, may I now request Professor SCN, that's how he's popularly known as, although his name is Sister Shikara, we all know him as only SCN. So can I have the privilege of inviting you to give the talk? Thank you. Is there a light charm on here? Which? Yeah, otherwise, you will not be seen. Right? Yeah. Because in the dark. Can you get the light Okay, move up here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is all now? Yeah. You can oh. come here. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll set it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. You okay now? Yeah. Right. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Murthy, for your generous words of introduction. It is indeed a large privilege and honor for me to be here this morning to give the second Professor M. George Memorial Interim Lecture instituted by Professor Sena Rao and Mrs. Rao. I would like to take this opportunity first of all to thank Professor and Mrs. Rao and also Professor Murthy and his colleagues at Kaiser Kiranandapuram for this special invitation to be here. I was associated with Professor George for many years. I thought at least I'll take a few minutes to reminisce about my association with him, if I may. It was probably in the first week of January 1978, about 43 years ago, that I first walked into the campus of IIT Khan to join as a young faculty in the chemistry department. Since already I had some correspondence with Professor George, I desired 
I will probably go meet him first before I get to meet the other department of chemistry. Professor George welcomed me with a lot of warmth and spent more than an hour chatting with me on various things that I should be doing at IIT Kanpur. That was just the beginning of a long mentorship that he started, that he extended to me throughout his stay at IIT Kanpur, which of course continued on after he moved to his then the first of all came to Vatican. Professor George, as many of you know, the great researcher of organic chemistry in the earlier years, and he moved to Toronto. What many people also have to remember that he has some very special, unusual qualities. That he always to nurture and nurture and science. That is a very, very important facet of him that I admire. Yeah. I was one of the beneficiaries of his benevolence for a long period of time. Whenever, whenever I was there in Kanpur IIT in the early days, whenever I ran into some difficulty, either in the so called academic front or in the personal front, I always went to the judge to seek his advice to his counsel. And invariably, after I talked to him, it turns out that most of the time the problems have been sorted out. He was also the one who actually talked to me about the so called do's and don'ts of doing teaching and research in IT campus. That was very important for me to know about some of these things at that time. And I still recall. I think maybe a couple of years after I joined, I was asked to take this class for a step one or two for undergraduate students at IIT, consisting of about 300 plus students at that time. Normally, classes of this type in 101, 102 are held in a very well known, famous lecture hall called the L7, those days. But it's actually called as a lecture theater. Mainly because every class that one takes in that room is considered like a theatrical performance. Since I was young and as novice, I was a little bit you know, nervous about handling a class of that kind after a couple of years after I joined. Then of course I talked to Brother George. He gave me a lot of tips about the kind of things that I should be doing in handling the class. More importantly, this is very, very Interesting, but he even told me as to what kind of a size of the letter or the structure that I should be writing on the blackboard. Because we are talking about the pre PowerPoint days, even the overhead projectors are not found yet in the classrooms. So basically, everything had to be written on the blackboard. And so he actually told me in the words that it is important throughout the class that you have to write in such a way that the letters and structures that you write. For the one hour or so in the class, will have to be visible even to the students that are sitting in the last bench. That kind of an advice really helped me in my teaching career for years to come. After he retired from Kanpur, then he moved to Aurora Trivandrum at that time. Now it is next to Andrum. He set up obviously the photochemistry unit, it became his passion afterwards. And more importantly, in association or in collaboration with Professor Rao, he set up this Foundation for Capacity Building in Science, FCBS, in Kerala. That was an excellent outreach program meant for the benefit of the undergraduate, postgraduate students and teachers of colleges in Kerala. I was very fortunate to have been associated as a resource person for this program right from the beginning. And for many years that followed, it was an excellent program that I actually enjoyed participating in that and I can learn quite a bit. It was during that process, because of Professor George and Professor Rob, I could actually work with a very large number of undergraduate and postgraduate colleges in Kerala. I was able to visit and interact with many students at that time. I therefore say that both Professor George 
and of course Professor Rao, after I moved to Bangalore, they have been really a major source of inspiration for me and helped me a lot during my entire academic career. Because before I start my lecture, I thought I will try to share if maybe a couple of slides, a few pictures from my collection of so-called uh, fond present memories of the association with Professor George. This is a picture that was taken in uh, probably in October 1888, just about the time when Professor George was retiring from Ayri Kanko. This is where you see Professor Meta at that time and me sitting there. And this is a picture that was taken somewhere around 1992-93 in the boardroom of the 10th Regional Research Laboratory, where Professor George is in present conversation with the then DG, Professor S.K. Joshi. I remember that because I was in a visit to Arara at that time. The picture the bottom that you see is really so called iconic picture, really. Where you would see Professor George and unusually sitting on the ground on a roadside. Because this is something that happened in December of 1988. Many of her were coming back by road, by bus from Assam in Karnataka, where the first meeting of the National Organic Symposium took place and we were all coming back to Bangalore by bus and we all took a break and also that you can see somebody very senior distinguished organic chemist of that time for the George here, for the P.R. Gomezichari, for the Kesa, for the Mehta, for the Charles Inkatak, for the Rangarathan there and for the Subarok and for the Swaminath in the background then you also see we are hungry and man eating a banana there and this is a picture that was taken, I remember right, in the year 2003 when some of us had gone to attend the meeting of the World Academy of Sciences that was held in Beijing. And in fact, was the same around as the president of class at that time. So, this picture was taken in the so called famous or the infamous Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Or at some time during the you know the class meeting where you see Prof. Ramam Sharma or Pramara or others there. Then this is the same time we all went to the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry, this was taken in the lobby of Shanghai Institute at that time, let's see Prof. George and see uh, you know uh, Pete Manohar and JP Mitchell and others and Prof. Kesa there. Yeah. Yeah. And this picture that you see here is the picture that was taken in a meeting of the Chemical Society of India that was Murthy referred to. This was held in probably one of the early meetings that was held in that Madras, Chennai, at IIT Madras and Sigalari jointly hosted this meeting. And you can see Professor George and Professor Rao sitting in the third row. And this is again another meeting that took place in Bangalore when I organized a meeting of the Indo French Center for Organic Synthesis. This is probably the first meeting of the Indo-French Center that we had and I was a job with a couple of uh, French colleagues who came to attend the meeting at that time. So at this point I thought I would probably give a general outline of what I will be talking about today. The outline I'd like to really will talk about the historical development of organic chemistry in India, research in India, and of course the most significant contributions in organic chemistry and the scientists who actually were able to contribute to the development that has taken place and briefly touch upon the current trends in organic chemistry research in India and towards the end we will pose the general question as to where may the discipline go in the next 20 years and when it's go by this, this is a question that I would like to ask and see whether we have the answers to that question. Let us then begin from the beginning. That means we have to go back to the so-called colonial days under the British Raj and how chemistry started to develop during that period. You can see here the British were in general not really interested in scientific development of India. But a small exception they had to make in the case of chemistry because they needed chemistry. Because his role in commerce, administration and good governance they needed to have and more importantly from the colonies point of view the main was a first institution the chemical knowledge was repaired. Therefore they were kind of forced to support chemistry in some form like in Iran. So India essentially was the first country outside the western world to take to modern science. And within India, the lead came from Bengal, as many of you probably know. 
And Acharya Prasanna Chandra Ray was the first non West, first modern chemist. That's really where the modern chemistry that we talk about today started with Acharya P.C. Ray. Acharya P.C. Ray, as many of you know, at least who look at chemistry and the history of chemistry, he is considered the father of modern chemistry in India. He is very well known for some of his early work on Nicholas Nitride and related to the He published a lot of work related to that and they are considered very important, significant contributions at that time. But in addition to the so-called inorganic chemistry, but he also had developed organic chemistry and worked on organic surface chemistry, chemistry of metacyclic compounds as well. Not only that, he actually trained some of the very well known organic chemists at that time. Some of them who became leaders of organic chemistry in the country in subsequent years. To give, mention a few, Prasanna Chandra Guha, you will have an occasion to talk about, P.C. Guha was a student of Acharya P.C. Ray. Not only did he work on organic surface chemistry and recycling compound, he also the one who established, he would realize the importance of industrial applications of chemistry and make it accessible to the common man and to society, he established a thing called chemical and pharmaceutical box and you know too, to manufacture pharmaceuticals through his own yearning. He didn't really get money from anybody outside. So that way, there was a remarkable individual who set the tone for research in chemistry and in organic chemistry as well in India. After PC Ray, he was at Dhaka College and later on he did all the work in the Kalkata University. But after PC Ray, the person who made some contribution to organic chemistry in India is was E. R. Watson at Duck College, and basically he was a dye chemist. He made a lot of contribution to synthetic dyes in the very early days. And in fact, around 1918, he wrote a big book on the color in relation to chemical constitution that considered the air of at that point in time, but understanding the nature of compound and their color and so forth. That way, E. R. Watson had made enough contribution in a completely different area from what P.C. Ray had done at that time. Then another person after P.C. Ray from India who made some important contributions that we have to remember is Baba Katar Singh that many people may not even know. He started his work with Dhaka College. He was greatly inspired by Acharya P.C. Ray and P.R. Watson. And initially he was at Dr. College, later he moved to Ravenshire College in Katak, and toward the end he worked for a number of years at the Benares University in Varanasi. But what is interesting and important to note, in the year around 1912-1913, he was talking about Siri chemistry. The Siri chemistry, you have to remember, still at its infancy, that not many people are even looking at as a possibility of doing research in Siri chemistry. Around 1912-1913, he actually had conducted research work on theory chemistry of ozonium compound, theory chemistry of cap derivatives. It is something unbelievable because he was way ahead of his time. Unbelievably exciting work that he tried to do it with limited facilities and knowledge really at that point in time. There are not many textbooks are available on theory chemistry at that point. Until ahead of his time, he worked and tried to make some useful contributions to the theory chemistry of organic compound. Around this time, around 1912-1915, the two gentlemen from Britain, the United Kingdom, they came to India. And these two people, J.L. Simonson, who was a topinoid chemist, natural product chemist, and then J.J. Sember, both of them worked at the Department of Organic Chemistry at the Indian Institute of Science. What we have to remember is that Simon was the one, he was initially a person at the Presumptive College in Madras. Later on, he actually worked as a chemist at the Darabon Forest Research Institute. And in 1915, he joined Organic Chemistry Department, IAC, as a professor. And he was interested mostly in the coconut chemistry. He was the one to introduce natural product chemistry in India, really speaking, in that sense. And somebody was working on essential oils and and so on, natural products again. And around the year, he was there between 1812 and 1826. What is interesting to see is around 1814, because already the World War I has started. And a lot of sandalwood was being produced in Mysore. 
because of the world war breaking in, they didn't know because they export to the Europe and other places at the completely of your stock. It could not be exported anymore because of the problem. And so the Maharaja of Mysore at that time didn't know what do you do with a lot of the saddle wood that being produced at that time. And therefore, he requested Maharaja of Mysore at that time to was a Sambaro at IAC Bangalore and see whether he can carry out research on sandalwood and extract oil from sandalwood. But there's a remarkable thing to happen for Maharaja to go to a private institute to IAC, an academic institution, to talk about doing things in a collaborative manner. Because already Sambaro had a couple of patents on the extraction of sandalwood oil. Maharaja Mysore, Krishna Jodhya was very impressed with what he had done. So in 1816, he gave a lot of money to establish an experimental factory in the vicinity of IAS in Bangalore to manufacture sandalwood oil. So that way the government soap factory was born and so called what we call as the iconic Mysore sandalwood that's where the soap was produced. And that factory, what's originally called the government soap factory, is now the government of Karnataka, is known as KSDR. Karnataka Soaps and Petitions Limited, they recently celebrated the, the centenary year, is doing extremely well, probably one of the most you know, productive companies in Karnataka now of the government, but is doing exceedingly well. And also you have to remember, so nowadays we talk about what we know as the PPD model, private public partnership and so on. But these are all more recent five ages. But this is probably is one of the first examples of what you call the successful PTV model by the state of Karnataka, the Mysore state, and the private institute at that time, Zara Institute, and an academic person was involved in this, and eventually it became a successful uh, thing. And Sarko, of course, the process served as a consultant of this factory for many years until about 1926. You also see some of the advertisements that were there for the iconic uh, Mysore Central Soap. This is probably the advertisement that came out in 1928, 1924 for the so-called luxury Mysore Central Soap. It became a very successful product which is used even today. And that came out of this collaboration between the private and the public partnership. So the result we are going to be now trying to look at the highlight of again in the research in earlier years. Say between 1905 and 1930. In fact, there's a very interesting article. There's a Canadian Canadian by name Guai. He wrote an article entitled Emergence of Basic Research on the Periphery, Organic Chemistry in India, 1907-1926, in a journal called Psychometrics in 1986. He essentially tries to summarize, of course, I have taken out only the relevant portion from his article in this paper. He says, Organic Dye Chemistry and Structure Illusory and Natural Products. As the main theme of work during this 25 30 year period. And he summarizes his own observation. And to say it is a mixed bag. Mostly research done in chemistry of turbines, such an elucidation of the so called wood smelling compound that are found in trees and in some plants and in photochemistry. That's the way he tries to summarize what was done during that period. That may not be fully correct, but partly right. Then we come to the next stage of development in the country that probably was the golden age or what you would call as natural product chemistry in India between 1830 to 1970. There is a very nice, very interesting article that has been written by Dr. K. Nagarajan in the Indian Journal of History of Science that was published in 2014, essentially trying to summarize the kind of work that was done because natural product chemistry in India was considered one of the topmost kind of areas of research in the country during the 40 year period. Really the topmost kind of work was done from India at that point in time. And it's also around that time that you have to remember 1926, the two people that I talked about earlier from IAS the background, Simonson and Sarbaro, both of them retired from service. And they had to go back to the country, to England. So suddenly the Indian Institute of Science was left without their leading organic chemists. They needed somebody as they had a the department of organic chemistry there and they have the lookout. That's all. And this is the time they were looking for somebody. And it turned out Acharya P. C. Ray 
was in Deaf College, and then he also moved to Katrina University by that time. And he wrote, this is from Ajari P.C. Ray's writing that I have, this is quote. In 19, he writes about P.C. Guha, who is eventually coming up there to IASC in 1928. He says, in 1916, another young man of wonderful energy, pluck and perseverance, joined my laboratory. This was Patrugatanda Guha. Under ordinary circumstances, he would have actually worked under E.R. Watson. I told you about E.R. Watson, who was in the organic dye chemistry, and he had to leave, go back to England, and suddenly P.C. Guha was left with nobody to work with. And then he approaches P.C. Gray, and then he writes, so as the letter had gone on home on Hello, Guha found himself really stranded. In despair, he wrote to me almost in previous terms, saying that his future career was about to be cut short abruptly, and expressing an ardent desire to work under me. This is all support for the you know, Atari PC day. He says, I welcomed him to my laboratory, thus began a happy and fruitful partnership. And so when IASC was looking for a good organic chemist to help the organic chemistry division department there, and one of the people that probably was considered as a possible candidate was PC Guha. And you can see here that he also goes on to write about PC Guha had a happy and instinctive insight into the mechanism of reaction, and according to this, he proved to me to be a godsend. In collaboration with him, I published two papers, but he was not wrong in striking out his own path. In due course, he came out with flying colors in his academic career. This is what Tizi writes about Tizi Goa, and then of course Tizi Goa has offered a position as professor of organic chemistry as he and how he comes to the institute, takes over the position left by Sandaro and Simonson, joins in 1838. So this is P.C. Guha. P.C. Guha was both at the IASC between 1838 and 1852. And it is very interesting, he set up a very active research laboratory on the synthesis of mono and circuit of chemistry, which by cycling compounds, he worked on three chemistry, of resonance, very thin and so on, very large number of things. But what he is particularly known or he remembered is he worked on essential oil and natural power. And he trained a large number of people. What is important is that he trained three giants of organic chemistry that I will talk about soon, who made tremendous impact in the country as far as organic chemistry was concerned. And three people I will probably mention about is Subde. Was a Sibhat Acharya and was a Swaminath. These are the students of PC Guha. He trained them at IASC Bangalore. And that is a tremendous contribution to organic chemistry and research in this country. And then at the same time in IASC, there's another R.C. Shah who was working with Sambaro. Of course, Sambaro was to the end that time before uh, PC Guha joined. And R.C. Shah was an undergraduate student. He did his master's degree similar to Bombay University from IASC at that time, or it was also called as the associate membership of the IASC during those days. He worked on natural products and terpenoids with Sadhguru, but eventually he went to Bombay and later on, just about the time the National Chemical Laboratory was being set up, he became the deputy director of NCL Pune. And he worked, he got out his own uh, area of coverage and promo, he worked on, and he made very useful contributions to this area. Then we talk about Jesse Bergen. Jesse Bergen is the one that you would say he's from Canada University. He was probably the one who started doing organic synthesis in this country. Because at that time it was very difficult to even plan synthesis. We are talking about 1930 to 1962, that's actually period for him. He made an outstanding contribution. Even today, if you believe, the synthesis of finance chain that is derivative by AC Bargainer's classic is a work. And also at that time there was some work that was controversial and probably not very sure about was the one that is known as Dabiano Sasset. At that time there was a lot of interest during that period and people were not sure about the structure of this molecule. And Bergen took up the synthesis of that Dabiano Sasset and derivative at that time and he had to be very well known but it's synthetic work that was initiated in this country, that part. Then we come to the arrival of what we call as the primates of natural product chemistry in this country. After 
Simon Sonnen and Sarbano and then Pisi Guha, the ones that really made a tremendous impact as far as natural water chemistry in this country are these three people, the Kira Sashadri in Nishiri at Andhra University and Nekron at Delhi University, and Dr. K. Bagatram, Nishiri at Institute of Chemical Technology in Bombay, later at the National Chemical Award in Pune, and of course Azimat Chatterjee at Calcutta University. They made real remarkable contributions and they made the India the capital of the natural water chemistry in this country. And Seishadri was well known for his work on plant chemistry, oxygen heterocycles, flavonoid pigments, and so on and so forth. And Vikitram was the one as a specialist in the area of dye chemistry. After Watson initiated the work, not many people were looking at organic synthetic dyes in that sense seriously as a research topic. And Vikitram was the one who made organic synthetic chemistry, dye chemistry, as an important area of work, particularly from the point of view of technology. And he also well known for what is known as the Baker Baker Common Transformation, is a textbook reaction, no you know, name reaction that people study. And this is so called dye chemistry as a seminal work carried out by him. And Asima Chatterjee, they all know for right from the early days, she stuck through and studied what area of alkaline chemistry all the time. She was the first Indian woman to earn a doctorate in science. Rather than Indian organic chemists who work in the field of organic chemistry in general and phytomedicine in particular. He works on eco alkaloids and anti epileptic drugs, anti malarial drugs, and he made, he made tremendous contributions during the period 1917 to 2006. And these three are really considered as the primates. They rule the world really in the area of the two part chemistry and made it. And put it on the international map of natural uh, products. Then, of course, we had, followed by Dr. T. R. Govindachari, at, initially at the Sunshine College in Chennai, or Madras at that time, and later on he moved to Sibar as a center where he continued his work on natural product chemistry. He worked on alkali chemistry, terpenoid, oxygen heterocycles, and many very really interesting compounds that he has isolated during that period of time. Made, even after his retirement, towards the end, he was talking about very complex molecule that is derived from me uh, as a directive. He worked on that at the age of maybe 80, 85, and trying to come up with methods for isolation of that direction. That was a, considered a remarkable piece of isolation technique and structure determination at that time. And PC Mata, after Jesse Burden, Nobody else was really doing organic synthesis, really speaking at that time. They see BC Data and the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science are the one who now decided he would try to pursue some work in the area of synthesis, let's say, of terpenoids. And he tried to look at some little bit more complex molecules than the one that was handled earlier in the Indian scenario. And was it became energy and the Indian Institute of Science who took over later on after TC Guha. And the other department of organic chemistry, he was basically working in the area of steroid chemistry, synthesis of isosteroids and compounds like equilinane, estrone, the conversion of equilinane to estrogens, and so on. At that time, these are all considered extremely difficult and challenging problems to look at those things. And so he made very important contributions to steroid chemistry, steroid synthesis of those things. Then, of course, we had three other people that I have to mention here. This is to be another question. Was now was at the small college in Chennai, was Madras Christian College. From there, he tried to do work in the area of physical organic chemistry, trying to look at reaction mechanisms as far as hydrolysis or oxidation reaction mechanism of oxidation with chromic acid and so on and so forth. And he trained a very large number of people in physical organic chemistry, particularly in kinetics oxidation and so on at that time. And was in Elor Rao and Amra University, he again was trained by Pierre Seishadri and again he worked on saponins, alkaloids, lignans, flavonoids, and etc. And of course, he made in that area in, uh, from Andhra, he made tremendous contributions to the product This is Vidit Telak again on the moment of the Ram. He was trained as a technologist from the UDCT in Bombay. And what only did he do organic chemistry research, but he was more interested in organic chemistry technology. His special reference to heterocyclic compounds, heterocyclic steroids, chemical, biotechnical, and synthetic dyes. 
But what is important, even the one who initially tried to establish several small, medium and large scale industries to produce organic intermediate, tiles, pesticides, textile auxiliaries. So where he was really trying to connect basic academic research to industrial application to resources, he was one of the early ones to show that it can be done and can be done successfully. Then I have to talk about two little organic areas of that time. Again, from a small university, one is was a Balaya that you see here. This is from Anamali University in Chinambaram, from a small state university in the southern part of the country. He tried to do some very pioneering work in the area of physical organic chemistry, organic central compound. Particularly, he is known for his work in the synthesis of pecorinos, and their chemistry that derived from them. He is also the one who is known for his work related to say in our metal resonance. And these are people who are working with limited facilities in a state university system to make very impactful kind of contribution to that. That of course was a big enemy, but the nature of science was really a physical organic chemist with merit. He worked on problem areas of molecular rearrangement, chemical kinetics, and so on. And he again was two people who were physical organic chemists. At that time, it was not that. There are many people in the Western world who are doing things, but these two probably were very, very noteworthy contributions from India at that point. Then I have to talk about Dr. Nityanan. Dr. Nityanan probably is the one at the Center of Drug Research Institute of Lucknow, was the first one to really seriously do what we call as medicinal chemistry today. And he led the group related to medicinal chemistry in this country. And at CDRI, he tried to look at bio. Organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry as major themes and look at development of new drugs. And Centromon is one of the drugs that he developed at CDRI that became extremely popular and was one of the success stories of CSIR at that time. Then we had Nasikuri from IIT Karakpo. Earlier, when we talked about studio chemistry, I mentioned about Baba Kakar Singh, who initiated work on studio chemistry in the very early days. But there's not much he could do because of the limited knowledge and facilities available at the time. But Nazikuri was trained by Ernst Elia, the father of Sri chemistry in a way. So when he came back in this country, at Ayati Karako, he tried to develop new kind of reagents for what you would call as energy-selective reactions of various things, oxidation reductions, etc. And also tried to look for biomimetic methods for synthesis of naturally occurring terpenoids and so on. So that way. One of the early ones in this country to contribute towards chiri chemistry more seriously than ever before was was Nasikuri and I think I This is the one I was talking about as the three people who became colossus in that area of work. And this is Professor S. Bharacharya that you see there, Professor Sudhay, and Professor Swaminathan. These three people have something in common. Number one. They were great organic chemists doing very different things. Of course, both Bhattacharya and Subdev were natural product chemists. They tried to do a lot of reactions, mechanisms, different kinds, and so on. But for some other was interested in synthesis as well. But what is important, as you mentioned, the common between them was all of them were students of the Indian Institute of Science, Department of Organic Chemistry. One. And two, all of them were students of Professor Prasanna Chandra Goha. And, this, and more importantly, all of them worked at the same time with Professor Desi Goha. So they all became giants of organic chemistry in the coming years. That's remarkable to see that how one, three people were there at the same time with Desi Goha became really very, very important contributors to organic chemistry development in this country. And Desi Bharatiya, of course, worked over 100 complex natural products, particularly terpenoids. Professor Sukhdev worked on plant secondary metabolite to a large extent. And he worked on glucosterols, and he was also interested in Indian raw materials which are cheap, like lac, turpentine oil, devadaru, Indian medicinal plants. And at that time, made some tremendous, important contributions from natural product chemistry to useful products that can be commercialized. So later on, he actually worked at Masi Camp <coughs> after he moved from National Chemical Laboratory. So the Swaminathan at the Madras University was going through right from there. He was working on the synthetic approaches to monoaromatic steroids. He was one trying to develop new methods and synthesis of monoaromatic steroids at that time. He worked on molecular rearrangement. And what is particularly important to note, 
Many years after he retired, he started to work on synthetic synthesis and organic catalysis. In fact, many of you probably know that the organic catalysis, asymmetric organic catalysis, has got a double prize recently for the month back. And he was one even before Benjamin List or uh, David Macmillan started doing work in the 90s. Of course, he was not as successful as others, or he had not developed it as a way that he would have developed later on. But at that point, he was way ahead of his time to study the aspect of organic catalysis, particularly involving proline based catalysis or doing chemistry. It is an organic catalysis work. And he made some very interesting contributions. But this was all developed with better. Better understanding came out because of Benjamin List and David uh, uh, Macmillan. But he did this work on symmetric synthesis much, much later. Many years after he had the age of about 70, 80, he was doing this work on symmetric synthesis. So these are people who are passionate about chemistry. Again, chemistry that they're doing. And of course, they claim the claim the number of people. Then I have to make a brief mention about was it, Mr. Rao, he was a student of Professor Sukhdev at the IAC Bangalore. He worked on synthesis of terpenoid to a large extent. He actually contributed in his own way. Very simple methods of doing synthesis of one terpenes, a set of and that's one to a large extent, one of the set of And he was a nursing man at Pune University, again, a state university system. He was a student of Professor T.R. Govindichari, the trained in natural product chemistry. Therefore, he continued to work on alkaline chemistry, all right. But more importantly, he developed his own area of work related to main group organometallic chemistry, particularly related to the lithiation chemistry. Heteroatom directed lithiation reaction in India to do that kind of chemistry in the so called ET is considered a remarkable piece. It's not very easy to do. And he developed some very, very important contributions to the area of lithiation reaction, a directed lithiation. And Dr. Emunda at CDI, after uh, Nithyana, he of course is a bioorganic chemist, interested in medical chemistry, worked on various kinds of uh, carbonyl chemistry as well. And this, he is known for his work on related to organol. And more importantly, he worked on glycosylase like, activity, cyclic tetrapeptide, and so on and so forth. And to a large extent related to developing new drugs that can be used at Chiriyala. I was a very, very simple that's why I was a teacher in, in a small college in uh, Chennai, in Vivekananda College, was a student of Antikrishna. He set up an active research group to do active research in an undergraduate or a postgraduate college. It's not an easy thing to do in this country. And we are talking about the 70s and 80s, at that time. He worked on the area of physical organic chemistry, chemical kinetics, and trained a number of young people in the areas of physical organic chemistry. So if you are now going to talk about so-called highlights of work done during the so-called 1930s and 70s, chemistry of natural products, mostly from plants, has been a continuous activity in India for many years in terms of isolation, structure determination. And Indian chemists uncovered many novel structures that are not known and the first of its kind at that time. It has also been well recognized in the international scientific community. And of course, some work in the area of cell organic chemistry related to, to kinetics of oxidation and other things are done. Then we come to the period between 1970 to 2000. Because this is about also the time you have to remember that the IITs have been established in the 60s. And central universities like Northeastern Hill University, University of Hyderabad have already been set up. And also there is some kind of a renaissance of the CSI laboratories like RR and Hyderabad and NC and Pune. There are all changes taking place in this case. Therefore, there is a different way of thinking. The mindset is changing in terms of what can be done. And so, this is the period where you talk about emergence of total synthesis of natural products and new synthetic methods method became the point of interest for many people in this country. And this is about the time when the George joined at, uh, at the Kanfu. And of course, he didn't take up like others natural product chemistry. And he was doing something totally different from what others were doing. And you are actually looking at electron transfer processor, study of organic reactions, functional group transformation, electrocyclic reaction. And in fact, his early work on organic photochemistry, photo transformation of benzene to batteries and synthetic utility are really remarkable pieces of work. He was very different from the others who were doing organic chemistry research at that time. 
And of course, after he moved to Toronto, set up this photochemistry unit, then he was more interested in photoreaction using nanosecond, picosecond, laser applied photolysis techniques, and also he was interested in chemistry of other materials with special functional properties. So he, in fact, branched out from the basic organic chemistry that he was doing to a completely different area of physical organic chemistry, photochemistry, in a certain period. And then again, it's a remarkable contribution from George. Then I also have to mention about a few people like the student of the Golgi Chari, Ken Nagarajan, who mostly worked in the industry, but followed that important chemistry to the extent that it can be used efficiently for medicinal chemistry applications and so forth. He applied them to pesticide chemistry, and also he is very well known for his applications of NMR techniques to problems of structure and reactivity in organic chemistry and more specifically for encyclic chemistry. And Dr. Bakuni at CDRI was the one who was involved, not many people were looking at biosynthesis as an important option at that time. He was trained in biosynthesis, so he came back and set up an active school in the area of biosynthesis in CDRI. And though he looked on chemical investigation of Indian medicinal plant, and in fact he is considered more like alkaloid biosynthesis is considered a pilot in that sense. And it was a case at Punjab University, again, a state university system, where he was trying to do synthetic work with limited facilities at that place. He was working on solenum alkaloids, isosteroid work, and also looked at methodologies for benzene cyclization and, use, and lithiation reaction as synthetically useful process for doing organic synthesis. That's again, it is remarkable to do this kind of thing from a university system. It's not easy at all. Then we had Three people of similar type. You had Prof. Ranganathan and Vashan Ranganathan, initially at IIT Kanpur. They of course moved to Arara to Random later. Then eventually they were in the IIC, or in their regional laboratory in Trivandrum. Prof. So Ranganathan was mostly interested in synthetic chemistry, and of course he is well known for his work related to intermediate and methodologies related to the synthesis of prostaglandin at that time. His work related to prostaglandin synthesis, methodology was considered truly remarkable at that time. And Vashan Ranganathan, who started later independent work, was involved in very high quality work in the area of supramolecular chemistry, biological process at the level, and he made a tremendous contribution, particularly related to chemical nucleases over the years. Remarkable person. And he was a backup at cultivation of science. After Prisi Dada, he was the one who took up organic synthesis more seriously in this country. Because he worked on some of the products, because he by that time started working on the plant growth hormone like gibberlin, which was not easy to look at as a synthetic plant in those days. And then Gaga tried to look at some of these samples like gibberlin and venture out to do things which are not considered easy at that point. He was reasonably successful in a way. Now I have come to the so called what you would call as a turning point in getting uh, chemistry. So this is the time that you have between the 80s to the completely turn around the place. There are two people who arrive on the scene. First was Gordon Mehta, the University of Hyderabad, and Dr. Yemi Ramarao, and initially and Mishir when he joined there. This is a very difficult kind of period because until that point in time, while synthesis was being attempted in different places to a moderate level with moderate amount of success, Attempting to do the synthesis of complex biologically active natural product was considered to be the prerogative of the Western world, Europe and the North America. Mainly because at that time people practicing chemistry, organic chemistry, synthesis in our country, they did not even want to venture into doing a multi step organic synthesis. For the simple reason, the amount of effort that you put in. It may not be commensurate with the effort that you put in, the results may not be as good. And if you don't succeed, you don't get anywhere. So this is kind of challenging because when trying to do a multi-step complex natural product synthesis is considered like climbing up the Mount Everest. Not everybody would like to do. You need to have the right tools, right kind of an approach, right kind of a vision, right kind of an imagination to do that. With the result at that period, People who are not even willing to consider thinking because 
I don't think I don't want to waste my time. I don't think I'll be successful. So let the Western world do it and be done with that. But these two, in my opinion, was a Mehta and uh, Ramra, they broke the myth in the country. Because they decided to show in their own ways, by imagination, by their own unique ways, saying that we will try, we have the courage to do it, we admit that we can actually do this. But it turned out eventually that what was as good and in some cases actually better than what was published, what was done by our the chemist in the Western world. So that was a turning point in my opinion as far as organics is concerned. The remarkable turn around that was taking place. Because those were best of example, you were looking at this is a complex natural product as well as non-natural product at that time. And he was also one of the early ones to show you don't need to have chemical reagents to do chemical transformation, basically. And to do complex synthesis. Because he could simply do a complex synthesis of natural products, for example, using only heat and light, thermal energy and photoelectric. That's all. And no formal chemical reagent to be used for doing synthesis. And demonstrated that kind of a thing. That means you have to come up with your own imaginative way of doing synthesis. Your own ideas of planning synthesis, which have to be different from what the Western world is doing. And that's what he demonstrated. The same way Dr. Ramarao had his own unique, because he was a technologist, trained as a technologist. So he always he was trying to do synthesis with a difference. Saying whether method would be simpler, whether the method can be scaled up, whether the method will actually be an economically viable product, economically useful product. That's the kind of emphasis that he had. And therefore, he was very successful doing complexes of natural products using his own imagination and work. And so they had the courage to do, and they broke completely the myth at that time that in India we can actually do complexes of natural products. So they became role models in that sense for the next generation of organic chemists. Then, of course, I have to probably, I may not have time to go into the details of. Many of them, I will point out that you had for the Junjapa and Ila Junjapa at Nehu, the large extent, they worked on exciting chemistry, exciting synthesis. They also were well known for their so called Ila Junjapa animation reaction for building a romantic system. They were known. And for the Kasturi and Subara, for metal products in this the organic chemistry department, Dr. Rajapa, ACL Pune for his chemistry on heterocycles, and Kushpur chemistry is very well known for his work. Dr. Bhasis Brahmanian worked at IIT Madras on medical rearrangement, carbohydrate chemistry, and also he was one of those attempting to do what you would call as electro organic synthesis, not being done or being pursued at all in the country. Then we had Professor Rajesh Singh at Amritsar, University of Brahmanian University, looked at total molecular chemistry, and also he was trying to do something different as, as a collection in synthesis at that point in Amritsar. Then, of course, you would have a role, Dr. Gay Nair. At Aurora Trivandrum, he made tremendous contribution to this heterocyclic uh, system. And in fact, many people may not even know that we talk about organic catalysis, we talk about nucleophilic heterocyclic carbon catalysis. He was one of those in the very early days contributed tremendously to the understanding and application of NSC catalysis for organic synthesis in this country. Then, of course, Professor Ramamurthy, the nature of science, was there for about 10 years after that he went abroad. But he tried to put in a lot of effort on organic photochemistry in this country, with very outstanding contribution to organic photochemistry. So, in the result, if you are going to be talking about highlights of organic chemistry, the result between 1780 to 1985, people are looking at the total synthesis of complex natural products, synthesis of novel heterocycles, new synthetic matter, organic metallic chemistry, bio organic chemistry, catalysis, and some organic chemistry was done. And after the success demonstrated by Professor Mehta and Dr. Ram Rao, the next generation of organic chemists got enough encouragement. And therefore, there are many who could take up synthesis with a little bit more you know, hope that it can be done. And therefore, you find here Dr. J. Yadav, Subhraka Ghosh, Sri Krishna, Vishal Chakravarti, Ganesh Pandey, these are the people who took up total synthesis of natural products more seriously after these people showed that it can be done. So they had, in their own way, made important contribution to multi substance of natural product. Then I talked about Dr. Vankar, who is supposed to be here. And he not only worked on synthetic methods, development, 
but he also studied carbohydrate chemistry. He made tremendous contribution. And Dr. Iqbal was initiated at IIT Kanpur. He worked on research development. Later, after joining the Radio Laboratory, he became a successful medicinal chemist for applications of organic chemistry to medicinal chemistry. Then, of course, I also have to talk about Dr. Dari Sami at the University of Hyderabad, who was again one of the early ones, maybe the first one to do serious transmetal organic metallic chemistry in this country and its application for organic synthesis at the University of Hyderabad. Then, Dr. Ganesh was a Ganesh, who initially started at NCL Kone and later on at ISA Kone. He is the one which is very well known for his work in the area of bioorganic chemistry and more particularly to what we call as the PNA, peptide nucleic acid. So he has a stamp clearly on what kind of work can be done in the area of bioorganic using this what is called peptide nucleic acid. He made it very, very prominent and really very important work in this country. Then we have Professor Vinod Singh at IIT Kanku. He was one of the early ones to start doing serious organic catalysis, asymmetric organic catalysis in this country. And he has made tremendous contributions and he continues to do so. Then we have three people here that we see Professor Jose Maitra, Dr. Sandhir Bhattacharya, and Dr. Vasak, at IIT Kanku. They were the ones who really started off with organic chemistry, physical organic chemistry, and bioorganic chemistry, chemical biology. I am trying to look at material, particularly organic or gas, they made important contributions there. And the Vrindavan Rano at the cultivation of science, essentially the one who contributed to methods development and more importantly to methods that can be green, essentially the green chemistry and green technology, they have a lot of use of them. Now it is also around this time between 80 to 2000 is a period which is very important in the country as far as organic chemistry was concerned. Why? Because this is really the period where the birth of National Organic Symposium Trust, NOS, took place. The NOS, National Organic Symposium Trust, was formed in 1983, but only in 1988, the first organic chemistry conference was held in Hassan, and I probably showed you a picture earlier. And this is something I want some of you to read this, those who have not looked at it. We wrote a guest editorial a couple years ago in Agawarte, the National Organic Symposium Trust, shaping organic chemistry in India over 30 years. So in my opinion, the game was a turning point as far as expanding the horizon as far as organic chemistry and bringing organic chemistry under one umbrella, the way to speak. And that made a tremendous difference. And the people who were responsible, these are the founding trustees of NOST, and you see here, to the Gondichai, to the Swaminathan, to the Bhattacharya, to the Sudde, the Chairman, and of course to the George, who was the first Chairman of the North Council. They had, all of them were outstanding organic chemists. But they had other many things which are important. Number one, they all were passionate about organic chemistry. And two, they also wanted to bring all the organic chemists in the country under one umbrella and make sure you provide enough opportunities for organic chemists to get together, discuss, interact, and try to see whether this can be made as an active, vibrant discipline. And third, they also had compassion. So while they talked about the IITs and ISOs and so on, but they also said that people from the less endowed university system would be brought into the fold. Therefore, they wanted to look at inclusiveness as far as things are concerned. And that is important. And more importantly, when they formed the trust, they said that you will not depend on government funding for activity, you will probably look at it mostly from private donation, industry, and form a support for this. So they have a lot of resilience in terms of doing research in you know, their case. So also, the result during this period, if you say, between 95 to 2020, asymmetric synthesis, asymmetric catalysis, organic catalysis, multi component, renewable reaction, serious activation, all these were becoming more important area of the work. Then I would like to talk about now to the present generation. Really, there are six people that I have there are of course to be more, but I selected a few to show you. These are what you call as the some leaders of the present generation of organic chemistry in the country. Each one having their own niche, for example. So there are two other that you will see, like Prasad and uh, Sri and the Shaker are what synthetic organic chemistry trained in the world of Mehta or Dr. Ramarao, 
On the other hand, you had people like Dr. Jagos and Dr. Murthy here, they were branching out in the so-called the interdisciplinary areas of physical organic chemistry, photochemistry, molecular materials and so on, and they in their own way established a lead in organic chemistry research. Then we had Dr. Garaman at IASC, you know, carbohydrate chemistry, tendiment chemistry, which was not being pursued by many other people. Then we had Dr. Sadi Verma looking at bio-inspired materials, bio-inspired material synthesis and looking at their properties and so on became very and these are some of the people who are now contributing vigorously to some of these interdisciplinary areas. And so therefore if you now look at the present day younger generation of organic chemists, many of them are involved in aesthetic catalysis, aesthetic synthesis, CS activation, CS functionalization, chemical biology, so on and so forth. So what I am simply trying to say is many people, particularly after the events of the I, I said, because they all took place in the last 15 years. After the IIT, IITs, the ICERs have come into prominence, and many young people, organic chemists, have joined these institutions, and many of them are doing extremely well. As a result, my belief that organic chemistry is in good hands. Many of them are doing well, and they are publishing in journals of high repute and in an international level, challenging problems for the uh, handle. Therefore, in my opinion, Organic chemistry in the hands of the young people are really in safe hands, and there is a promising future for organic chemistry in this country. And I suppose I've taken out from a review article on cytometric analysis on organic chemistry, and I just tried to read out some of these relevant questions there. According to the author, I will go to the next one. Organic chemistry is a strong area of research in the chemical sciences in India. Accounts for more than one percent of world research output. Number one. Two, the change in emphasis for different subfields of organic chemistry are almost similar to India compared to the rest of the world. India's this activity in organic chemistry as reflected by the values of activity index was lower than the world during the 70s. However, the activity picked up during the 80s. Since then, according to the author, there has been a steady growth. And according to the they go. These are the three articles that I have kind of referred to here. There's an article came out in current science in 2015. There's an alliance of library and information studies in 2014. And analysis in 1999. These authors have simply tried to summarize and they say during 2004 to 2013, the general thing is slightly better than the world average, and the growth pattern is positive and similar to the worldwide research growth as far as organic chemistry is concerned. This is a general conclusion as far as organic chemistry research is concerned. Therefore, you ask the next question as to where do you think that organic chemistry will go? Can one predict as to what may happen? In the years to come, as far as organic chemistry is concerned. And therefore, you are talking about prediction. There is a general saying, this is a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tse, says, Those who have knowledge do not predict. Those who predict do not have knowledge. Therefore, it is very yeah, tricky thing to get into your prediction mode for anything. And again, Arthur Clarke is a science fiction writer, very well known. He talks about when a distinguished, when an elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost only right. On the other hand, when he says something is impossible, he is probably very wrong. And so therefore it is very difficult to say or predict. With the result, one would also like to say, fools predict the future, smart people actually create the future. And it is in your imagination as to what you will create for the future. And in spite of that, one could probably say in general, you are probably going to do synthesis in organic chemistry, not the same way we have done, it has to be differently. It has to be synthesis with a difference, but also you have to do synthesis and chemistry with that to be the purpose. It has to be catering to the needs of the society. That means sustainable development and societal needs are going to play an important role. Therefore, what you do today, you will have to read and see what way it will be useful. And the other thing that you say is that the influence of artificial intelligence and machine learning could probably have a very major impact on organic chemistry. People believe. And therefore, it could change the way we think about organic chemistry, what does not know. But regardless of where organic chemistry ends up, I think making molecules will always be important. You have to make molecules, whatever kind of study, whether you want to be in biology, whether it's materials, somebody is going to have to make molecules. And chemists and organic chemists will do that job for you. It is what chemistry makes central to all other areas of science, at least. And again, I quote from two. Well known organic chemist, Paul Wenger, 
You go on to say as to how it is important for you to, even if you don't make an ideal synthesis, how you keep in mind to make things in a practical fashion, in sufficient quantity, for the needs of the site or society in a way that environmentally friendly, if not ideal. Although ideally to be better to do ideal thing, but it may not be possible always. Therefore, can you try to reach ideality in a way that is acceptable to the society? And this thought I like very much, this was done 60 years ago by Albert Woodward, the Nobel laureate, legend in the area of organic synthesis. He wrote the art and science synthesis of organic compound, a prospect and prospect. And even today, at least in my opinion, that's probably is valid. He says, chemical synthesis is essentially entirely a creative activity in which art, design, imagination, and inspiration play a predominant role. The unique challenge which chemical synthesis provides for the creative imagination, the skilled hand, in short, that will endure as long as men write books, paint pictures, and fashion things that are beautiful or practical or both. It's probably true even today. And therefore, finally, I come to this. There are people who, contrary to many people, even in the chemistry community, contrary to what people believe, organic chemistry is still alive and alive and kicking. This is again the quote from Mark Twain, the great American humanist. When he was alive, there was no longer to return on him. And he goes on to say at that time, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. The human enterprise was once largely limited to what nature produced, but we are only limited by what we can imagine. And I am going to quote here from Sri Chagraja, one of the trinities of the Carnatic music. And he goes on to pay tribute to the music composers and performers of his time, and he pays the salute son. And with this, you think you can well know. The same way I would probably like to say that in organic chemistry in India, starting with a therapy series, we had uh, uh, Baba Katar Singh, Dia Seshadri, Asima Chatterjee, and uh, Beckett Ramar, and of course, including Professor George. We have so many giants of many chemistry who have contributed to our understanding of what we do today. We basically have been on the shoulders of these giants all these days. So we wait to them, we salute them. Thank you very much. I was just uh, going to go through the names once again, but I think his conclusion says that it all. Fabulous talk. I don't think I have to say anything. The talk was so cogent and vivid. Please join me in appreciating the fantastic talk. I think uh, this is uh, one of the wonderful uh, you know, memorial lectures that we have in our campus. In fact, the only one. I'm, I hope that we'll have several created in the campus as we go along. But in fact, I'm particularly happy that I think Professor S. Chandrasekhar has sketched a really family tree like for the emergence of organic chemistry to, uh, to several of us and of course, several that have joined online. Uh, sir, I think it was a wonderful talk, I must say. I think uh, this memorial lecture instituted by Professor Siena Rao Bhartaratna comes with some kind of a cash price and in appreciation of the, the nice talk given by Professor S.C. and it's indeed my veritable joy to so give away the prize. So it comes with a cash prize of uh, whatever, I think it's a pleasure and uh, a citation and the cash prize. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, uh, from Aisa Tirunantapuram, it is my proud privilege to pass on to this a small souvenir for coming over and... Oh, thank you! Thank you.
Sir, thank you for grace in the occasion. Sir, this is yet another one to so that you, know you will remember our life. Uh, Thank you. 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 Thank you.